It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the Extinction Marathon, Visions of the Future, which is co-curated by the artist and political and ecological activist, Gustav Metzger, who has been our guiding light and inspiration for this year's marathon. Throughout his long career, Gustav has used art to tirelessly campaign about the grave effects of climate change and the loss of biodiversity on Earth. As artists, Gustav has said, we need to take a stand against the ongoing erasure of the species, even when there is a little chance of ultimate success. It is our privilege and our duty to be at the forefront of the struggle. While humanity has moved through extreme crises in the past, time and speed is of the essence. And Gustav, it's a very great honor that you're with us today. This year is a ninth marathon, which was conceived by Hans Ulrich Obrist in Stuttgart in 2005, and launched here in 2006 with the interview marathon during his first year at the gallery, when he became co-director of exhibitions and programs and director of international projects. The marathon is an intensive two-day forum for artists and influential thinkers from a wide range of, of disciplines to investigate and probe one topic from many different angles. Previous marathons are the interview marathon in 2006 with Rem Koolhaas, the experiment marathon of 2007 with Olaf Eliasson, the Man manifesto marathon in 2008, in 2009, it was the Poetry Marathon, the Map Marathon of 2010, the Garden Marathon in 2011, the, Ma the Memory Marathon in 2012, and last year's 89 Plus Marathon, which focused on the generation born in or after 1989, the year when the Berlin Wall came down and the internet became readily available. This year's marathon is dedicated to the pangolin, which is unique in being the world's only truly scaly mammal. They occupy a diverse range of habitats from tropical forests to dry woodland and rubber plantations. Yet earlier this year, all eight species of the pangolin were officially listed as critically endangered on the 50th anniversary of the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List of Threatened Species. The marathon will include stage participations, talks, screenings, and performances, as well as an installation by the Estonian artist Katja Novikskova. This is the final weekend of the Serpentine Pavilion designed by Chilean architect Smiljan Radic, who is here with us today in the front row. And I do hope that those of you who have not yet visited it will be able to do so. What could be more complex, timely, and indeed urgent than the subject of this year's marathon? As the British novelist Adam Thirlwell succinctly says, one pleasure of art is to be more precise with time than the usual clocks, which would right now mean asking if there is anything more immediate than the problem of extinction, anything more urgent than the end of the world. Many artists have been pointing in recent years towards the theme of extinction through their work. Philippe Pereno's current exhibition at Pila Corias, his first in the UK since his 2010 solo exhibition at the Serpentine Gallery, looks at the continual cycle of death and regeneration. While at Hauser and Wirth, Pierre Wieg's expansive exhibition reveals a chronology which traverses a tumultuous 30 million years of evolution. Planet Earth and the staggering web of life to which we all belong are worth protecting for their own sake. This is reflected by the sense of wonder and profound respect for nature that runs deep in many cultures and religions. People instinctively relate to the well-known pro proverb, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Yet with another 2.4 billion people to be added to the human population by 2050, the challenge of providing everyone with food, water, and energy that they need is already a daunting prospect. Biologists talk of a background extinction rate, a normal rate of extinction in Earth's geological and biological history. In the 20th and 21st century, however, 
species extinction has accelerated as a result of man-made intervention, leading Elizabeth Colbert to, to claim that we're currently living in the sixth extinction. In her book of that name, she explains that in the past half a billion years, there have been five mass extinctions on Earth when the diversity of life suddenly contracted. The accelerated substantial biodiversity losses we are experiencing now has led Colbert to warn that what we are currently experiencing is the most devastating extinction since the asteroid impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. We are joined this weekend by some of the world's most esteemed scientists, including the astronomer Sir Martin Rees, who in 2003 put humanity's odds of surviving the next 100 years at 50-50, citing threats from high-tech ca catastrophes to environmental impact in his book, Our Final Century. As Rees is at pains to point out, our Earth is 45 million centuries old, but this century is the first when one species, ours, can determine the biosphere's fate. This is a consequence of a rising population of humans, all the more demanding of resources, all the more empowered by technology. We have entered an era that is sometimes called the Anthropocene, a term used to describe the proposed epoch that began when human activities had a significant global impact on the Earth's ecosystems. As Rees says, we fret about minor risks, train cash crashes, carcinogens in food, low radiation levels, and so on. But we are in denial about some low probability, high consequence events. Pandemics and cyber disasters, for example, although the threats posed by both have been brought sharply into focus with the Ebola virus scare and increasingly frequent breaches of confidential information stored online. The Living Planet Report is the world's leading science-based analysis on the health of our planet and the impact of human activity. And the latest edition is not for the faint-hearted. One key point is that the Living Planet in Index, LPI, which measures more than 10,000 representative populations of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, has declined by 52% since 1970. Put another way, in less than two human generations, population sizes of vertebrate species have dropped by half. These are the living forms that constitute the fabric of the ecosystems which sustain life on Earth and the barometer of what we are doing to our own planet. We ignore their decline at our peril. We're using nature's gifts as if we had more than just one Earth at our disposal. By taking more from our ecosystems and natural processes than can be replenished, we are jeopardizing our very future. Nature cons conservation and sustainable development go hand in hand. They are not only about preserving biodiversity and wild places, but just as much about safeguarding the future of humanity, our well-being, economy, food, security, and social stability. Indeed, our very survival. There is optimism in the way in which the world extinction is spreading through the popular domain. In computer games, films, there is even a clothing brand that goes by the name Extinct. By recasting a subject that is so serious, and for many, deeply uncomfortable, and absorbing it into our vernacular, we achieve the first goal of raising awareness, which can then precipitate meaningful change. The purpose of this weekend apart from being a clarion call to action, is to set out a reflexive overview of extinctions themes and features contributions from over 80 remarkable people, from artists, poets, and filmmakers, to anthropologists, architects, and ev evolutionary ornithologists. Some of the questions we hope to address here will be, how do we understand ourselves in relation to our collective responsibilities? What is the artist's role in responding to mass extinction? What happens after the world has come and gone? Can artists, scientists, and thinkers imagine new visions of the future? How has the spectre of extinction come to inform artistic and literary practice? Philosophers Federico Campagna 
and Franco Biffo Baradi join a panel with the artist Jesse Darling to discuss the extinction of financial systems and cap capitalism. Sound recordist Chris Watson will present a new 30-minute sound piece of roosting starlings beneath Brighton's West Pier. Stuart Brand, editor of the Whole Earth Catalogue, will discuss the possibilities of de-extinction of genetically preserving species with Richard Prum, curator of natural history at Yale University. There are pre-existing and new, newly commissioned works on display by artists Susan Hiller, Gilbert and George, Benedict Drew, Ed Atkins, Cornelia Parker, Eve Laris Cohen, and more. Mathematician Marcus de Sotoy will tell three mathematical stories about extinction, survival, and immortality. The list goes on. I've spoken only about the pangolin in the briefest of terms so far. There are any number of species we could have chosen to dedicate the extinction marathon to. But by dedicating the marathon to this mammal, it will serve as a reminder of all those other species facing similar circumstances. The prehistoric looking keratin scales that cover the pangolin skin are unique among mammals. There are no others in existence with this adaptation. Its scales, the same substance as human fingernails, are used for medicinal purposes in Asia, where its meat is also sold as a luxury product. In the last decade alone, it is believed that more than one million pangolins have been poached from the wild. It is quite simply being eaten to extinction. Jonathan Bailey, London Zoological Society's Director of Conservation, is responsible for coordinating the Pangolin Specialist Group, which is taking action to study the behavior and ecology of this creature, and most importantly, address policy and affect global awareness to reduce demand for pangolin scales and meat. It was in discussion with Jonathan that I began to understand that the pangolin is a symbol for biodiversity and how the protection of genetic diversity might be this world's sole chance to eventually return to some kind of equilibrium. This is when I decided to adopt the pangolin and make it my own personal cause. The Serpentine's dedication to the pangolin also represents a wider institutional commitment to create a legacy around the topic of extinction and to make a contribution in an ongoing way. The Extinction Marathon invites us to respond together to a changing world, addressing visions of the future in all their scientific, artistic, and literary ramifications. And the conversation stretches far beyond these walls. Tomorrow morning, there is an opportunity to see a special screening and London premiere of Sandy McLeod's new film, Seeds of Time, which is based on the pioneering work of agriculturalist Carrie Fowler and looks specifically at the one of the most important resources we and future generations cannot live without, seeds. The screening is at 10 a.m. at the Gate Picture House in Notting Hill and open to marathon ticket holders free of charge. The entire marathon is being live streamed at thespace.org and the Serpentine's especially developed online platform called Extinctly, which gathers information about global resource depletion, conflict zones, and climate change, as well as artist projects and activists' call to action. Space and the Serpentine have co-commissioned two new online works by Gustav Metzger and Ed Atkins, and five new texts from key thinkers, all of which are published on the Extinctly website as well as on the space.org. The marathon is accompanied by a booklet conceived by designers David Rudnick and Ralph Rennie and partially printed with UV ink. I hope most of you have a copy, but if not, they're available at the back of the room where there are also black lights for viewing the UV text and images. There are also a number of posters which have been designed by participants in this year's marathon, also printed with UV and which are free to take home. Last, but by no means least, the Heather, I'm sorry, the artist Heather Phillipson's wonderful stage design, here you can see I'm standing on it, provides our background for the weekend. Heather presented a performance this summer as part of our part night series in the pavilion, which we were very honored and delighted to, uh, to present, and we're so thrilled to have an opportunity to work with her again. The greatest of thanks to Gustav Metzger without 
whom this entire event would not have been possible, and with whom we began conversations probably about five years ago. We are extremely grateful to you, as well as to all those individuals and organisations that have supported the marathon. In particular, Bloomberg Philanthropies for their extraordinary support of the entire 2014 autumn season, the space, and in particular Ruth McKenzie, the Hayden Family Foundation, especially Susan Hayden, the Helen Randag Charitable Foundation, and particularly Helen Thorpe, DALD Digital Life Design, especially Steffi Czerny. The vision and commitment of all those people, as well as their enthusiasm for the project, has been truly invaluable. Thank you, of course, to all our participants, both on stage and remote, and thank you, the audience, for being here.